Ahmed Jemal Pasha, commonly known as Jemal Pasha to Turks, and Jamal Basha in the Arab world, was an Ottoman military leader and one-third of the military triumvirate known as the Three Pashas that ruled the Ottoman Empire during World War I. Jemal was also mayor of Istanbul. There is discussion about his role in the Armenian Genocide, the Greek Genocide, and the Assyrian Genocide. Biography Ahmed Jemal was born in Mytilene, Lesbos, to Mehmet Nisif Bey, a military pharmacist. Between 1908 and 1918, Jemal was one of the most important leaders of the Ottoman government. Destined for the army, Jemal passed out from Kilali Military High School in 1890. He went on to the Military Academy in 1893, the Staff College in Istanbul. He was posted to serve with the 1st Department of the Imperial General Staff, and then he worked at the Kirkalize Fortification Construction Department bound to Second Army. Jemal was assigned to the Second Corps in 1896, being appointed two years later, the Staff Commander of Novice Division stationed on the frontier Salonika. Meanwhile, he began to sympathize with the reforms of Committee of Union and Progress on Military Issues. It was in 1905, when Jemal was promoted to major and designated inspector of Rumelia Railways. The following year he signaled Democrat she credentials, joined the Ottoman Liberty Society. He became influential in the Department of Military Issues of the Committee of Union and Progress. He became a member of Board of the Third Corps in 1907. Here, he worked with future Turkish statesmen Major Fett and Mustafa Kemal. Although Ataturk soon developed a rivalry with Jemal Pasha and his colleagues over their policies after they seized power in 1913, his grandson, Hasan Semel, is a well-known columnist, journalist and writer in Turkey, Balkan Wars. In 1911 Jemal was appointed governor of Baghdad. He resigned to rejoin the army in the Balkan Wars on the Salonika front line, attempting to bolster Turkish-European possessions from encroachment. In October 1912, he was promoted to colonel. At the end of the First Balkan War, he played an important role in the propaganda trace by the cup, against negotiations with the victorious European countries. He tried to resolve the problems that occurred in Constantinople after the Babai Ali attack. Jemal played a significant role in the Second Balkan War, and with the revolution of Cup on 23 January 1913. He became the commander of Constantinople and was appointed Minister of Public Works. In 1914 he was promoted as the Minister of the Navy. World War I, when Europe was divided in two blocks before the First World War, he supported an alliance with France. He went to France to negotiate an alliance with the French but failed and sided with Enver and Talat, that favoured the German side. Jemel, along with Enver and Talat, took control of the Ottoman government in 1913. The three Pashas effectively ruled the Ottoman Empire for the duration of World War I and were the three main perpetrators of the Armenian Genocide, the Greek Genocide, and the Assyrian Genocide. Jemal was one of the designers of the government's internal and foreign policies, nearly all of which proved disastrous for the empire. His policy for example to oppose the powers in Eastern Europe caused a dramatic escalation and the balkanization of the Slavic republics. Multiple contradictory allegiances in a redundant balance of power strategy aided immense complexity and immeasurable difficulties to Turkish logistics across thousands of miles of desert. After the Ottoman Empire declared war on the Allies in World War I, Enver Pasha nominated Jemal Pasha to lead the Ottoman army against British forces in Egypt and Jemal accepted the position. Similar to Enver, he proved unsuccessful as a military leader. Snubbed therefore by the Allies, Jemal switched his attentions to an alliance with the Central Powers, although he was at first opposed to a full alliance with Germany. He nevertheless agreed in early October 1914 to use his ministerial powers to authorize Admiral Souchon to launch a preemptive strike in the Black Sea. That caused Britain and France to immediately declare war on the Ottoman Empire the same month. 
Governor of Greater Syria Jemal Pasha was appointed with full powers in military and civilian affairs as governor of Syria in 1915. A provisional law granted him emergency powers in May of that year. All cabinet decrees from Constantinople related to Syria became subject to his approval. His offensives on both his first first Suez offensive and second attacks on the Suez Canal failed. Coupled with the wartime exigencies and natural disasters that afflicted the region during these years, this alienated the population from the Ottoman government, and led to the Arab Revolt. In the meantime the Turkish army usually commanded by Colonel Kress von Kressenstein pushed towards an occupied Sinai. The two men had a thinly disguised contempt for each other that was a weakness for the command. He was known among the local Arab inhabitants as al Safa, the bloodshedder, being responsible for the hanging of many Lebanese, Syrian, Shia Muslims and Christians wrongly accused of treason on 6 May 1916, in Damascus and Beirut. In his political memoirs, the leader of the Beirut reform movement, Salim Ali Salam recalls the following. Jamal Pasha resumed his campaign of vengeance, he began to imprison most Arab personalities, charging them with treason against the state. His real intent was to cut off the thoughtful heads, so that, as he put it, the Arabs would never again emerge as a force, and no one would be left to claim for them their rights. After returning to Beirut from Istanbul, I was summoned to Damascus to greet Jamal Pasha, I took the train. And upon reaching Ali we found that the whole train was reserved for the prisoners there to take them to Damascus. When I saw them, I realized that they were taking them to Damascus to put them to death. So, I said to myself, how shall I be able to meet with this butcher on the day on which he will be slaughtering the notables of the country? And how will I be able to converse with him? Upon arriving in Damascus, I tried hard to see him that same evening, before anything happened, but was not successful. The next morning all was over, and the notables who had been brought over from Ali were strung up on the gallios. During 1915-1916 Jamal had 34 political opponents executed as martyrs. At the end of 1915, Jemal with Viceroy Powers is said to have started secret negotiations with the Allies for ending the war he proposed himself to take over the Ottoman government as an independent king of Syria. These secret negotiations came to nothing, in part because the Allies reportedly could not agree on the future territory of the Ottoman Empire. France objected strongly, and Britain was unwilling to fund the imperial operations. McMeekin cast doubt on Jemal having made any such overtures to the Allies. His most successful military exploit was against the British Mesopotamian Expeditionary Force, which had arrived in early 1915 from India. 35,000 British troops marched north on Baghdad, hoping to take the citadel with relatively few casualties. Jemal Pasha was appointed in command, Marshal de Vast Army ultimately led by General Halil Kut that by the time of the siege of Kut al-Amara numbered 200,000 Turks and Arab allies. The British had evacuated wounded, with Jemal's consent, and attempted over the duration of the surrounding of the city on three sides, to send emissaries to request permission to leave. Jemal refused to compromise his winning position. Strafed enemy attempts to relieve with a Tigra score up the river by boats. They had underestimated Jemal's considerable administrative capabilities and will to resist the Allied armies. The Turks fought hard at Battle of C.T. Siphon, but the subsequent fate of POWs and civilians later enhanced Jemal Pasha's wartime reputation as a capricious and cruel general. Nonetheless the successes impressed T.E. Lawrence to write a significant account of their diplomatic encounters provides for a colorful character when finally cut fell in April 1916. The ever-present threat of Arab revolt fomented by British intelligence was rising throughout 1916 and 1917. Jemal instituted strict control over Syria province against Syrian opponents. Jemal's forces also fought against the Arab nationalists and Syrian nationalists from 1916 onwards. 
Ottoman authorities occupied the French consulates in Beirut and Damascus confiscated French secret documents that revealed evidence about activities and names of the Arab insurgents. Jemal used this information from these documents as well as from others belonging to the Decentralization Party. Jemal believed that insurgency under French control was the main reason for his military failings. With the documents he gathered, Jemil moved against the insurgency forces which were led by Arab political and cultural leaders. This was followed by the military trials of the insurgents known as Alila de Van Iharbi or Fizi, in which they were punished. Commander of 4th Army Gaza's head of garrison Major Tilla had seven infantry battalions, a cavalry squadron, and some camel troops. The British under Colonel Chetwood already had 2,000 troops in front of the city. Reluctantly Jamal marched with 33rd Division to relieve Gaza. Kressenstein was delighted to have repelled the British assault, and wanted to mobilize aggressively by driving into Shellal, Wadi Gaza, and Khan Yunis, but Jemal absolutely forbade it. The British had a whole division in retreat, so a two-battalion sortie would have been annihilated. The decision was correct. One of Jemal's associates in Iraq was engineer Colonel Heinrich August Meisner who built both the Hejaz and Baghdad railways was employed on an ambitious project to construct a railway to the Suez Canal at Bergif Gaffa. By October 1915 the Central Powers had already built 100 miles of track as far as the oasis of Beersheba. The Jemal insisted an extended railway would be needed to attack British Egypt. Known to be both ruthless and brutal by Western standards, he was completely committed to Turco-German military machine, and Britain would not relinquish ambitions to control Syria. Kemal and Jamal became increasingly skeptical of German capabilities, but Jamal worshipped the national hero, and was not yet prepared to openly back the German allies. He insisted on the possibility of a planned Allied assault behind the Yildirim Army, as 7th Army gathered at the Turco-German Aleppo Conference. In the shake-up that followed Jamal was demoted to a command of 4th Army under Gabriel von Falkenhayn. They now adopted a similar plan to Crest's plan for Gaza, and sent the Yildirim to Baghdad. It was not until October 1917 that the 7th Army could march south to face the growing threat from Allenby, hampered by the single-gauge railway, built away from the coastline to avoid a Royal Navy salvo. On November 7, the British captured Gaza, but Jamal had long since been forced to evacuate it. Although chased, he managed to retreat at speed. In December the Turks were driven out of Jaffa, Jemal's army still in retreat. The city fell without a fight. Falkenhayn had ordered evacuation on 14th, and the enemy had begun to enter the same day. But now the Turkish 8th formed a much stronger Duggan line. Jemal's organized defense of Gaza had been better than anticipated by the British. His army delayed him further at the Vital Junction railway station, but the British were probably unaware of its importance. The fighting in the hills was all but over by the 1st of December. On the 6th of December Jamal Pasha was in Beirut to make a speech publicizing the Allied deal to carve up, partition and influence for Syria-Palestine in the Sykes-Pico Agreement. At the end of 1917, Jemal ruled from his post in Damascus as an near-independent ruler of his portion of the empire, but he had resigned from the 4th Army and returned to Constantinople. On 9 April and then 19 April 1918, Jamal ordered evacuation of civilians from Jaffa and Jerusalem. Arabs were left to fend for themselves as the Ottomans would not accept responsibility for feeding them. The Germans were furious and rescinded the order, revealing the chaos in the Ottoman Empire. Jamal's ambiguous attitude to the subjects played into the hands of British rule. The Turkish line was solidified in readiness for the final onslaught at Nebi Samuel and Nahr el -Aya. To the south of Nebi were the defences of Beit Iksa, the heart and liver redoubts before Lifa, Deir Yesen, two systems behind Ain Karim, in all four miles of fortifications. 
Parliament in the last Congress of Committee of Union and Progress held in 1917, Jemal was elected to the Board of Central Administration. With the defeat of the Empire in October 1918 and the resignation of Talat Pasha's cabinet on 2 November 1918, Jemal fled with seven other leaders of the Cup to Germany, and then Switzerland. Military trial and assassination A military court in Turkey accused Jemal of persecuting Arab subjects of the Empire, and sentenced him to death in absentia. Later in 1920, Jemal went to Central Asia, where he worked on modernization of the Afghan army. Due to the success of the Bolshevik Revolution, Jemal traveled to Tiflis to act as a military liaison officer to negotiate over Afghanistan with the Soviets. Together with his secretary he was assassinated on 21 July 1922 by Stepan Dzargigian, Artashes Gevorgian, and Petros Terpofosian, as part of Operation Nemesis, in retribution for his role in the Armenian Genocide and the First World War. Jemal's remains were brought to Erzurum and buried there. Bibliography Aronson with the Turks in Palestine, London, A.J. Political Intrigue and Suppression in Lebanon During World War I, International Journal of Middle East Studies, Anderson, Scott, Lawrence, Indiana, Arabia, War, Deceit, Imperial Folly and the Making of the Modern Middle East, Anchor Books, Benson, Crescent and the Iron Cross, London, Benz, Wolfgang, Voretel and Genozid, Ideologische Promissen des Volkermords, Bolor Verlag, Cleveland, William, A History of the Modern Middle East, Boulder, Westview Press, Jemal Pasha, Ahmed, Memories of a Turkish Statesman, 1913-1919, London and New York, George H. Doran Company, Ericsson, E.J., Order to Die, A History of the Ottoman Army in the First World War, Westport, Court, Findlay, Carter Vaughan, Turkey, Islam, Nationalism, and Modernity, Yale University Press, Fromkin, David, A Peace to End All Peace, The Fall of the Ottoman Empire and the Creation of the Modern Middle East, New York, Avon Books. G. G. Gilbar, ed. Ottoman Palestine, London, Haddad W. W. Oxenwald, Nationalism in a Non-Nationalist State, The Dissolution of the Ottoman Empire, Columbus, Ohio, Howard, H. N., The Partition of Turkey, Our Diplomatic History, 1913-1923, Norman, Oklahoma, Von Kressenstein, F. Kress, Zwicken Kaukasis und Sinai, Jarbuch des Bundes der Eisenkampfer, von Kressenstein, F. Kress, mit dem Türken zum Suezkanal, Berlin, Lawrence, T. E., Seven Pillars of Wisdom, A Triumph, London, Mango, Andrew, Ataturk, The Biography of the Founder of Modern Turkey, Woodstock, N. Y., The Overlook Press, ISBN 1-58567-011-1. McMeekin, Sean. The Russian Origins of the First World War. Cambridge, Massachusetts. Bell Knapp Press of the Harvard University Press. Auger, Phoenix Ascendant. The Rise of Modern Turkey. London. Provence, Michael. The Great Syrian Revolt and the Rise of Arab Nationalism. University of Texas Press. ISBN 0-292-706804, Ramsor, E. The Young Turks, The Prelude to the Revolution of 1908, New York, Rubin, Barry M., Turkey in World Politics, An Emerging Multi-Regional Power, Lynn Riena Publishes, ISBN 9781555879542. Salabi, K. Burke, J. Chevalier, Beirut under the Young Turks, as depicted in the political memoirs of Salam Ali Salam, Les Arabes par les Archives, XVIEXXE Sickles, Shaw, S.J., Shaw, E.K., Reform, Revolution and Republic, The Rise of Modern Turkey, History of the Ottoman Empire and Modern Turkey, Two of Two Vols, Bibliography of Hist
Official History, Sergi McMahon and C. Falls, Military Operations, Egypt and Palestine, Volume 2 London, 1930, Yildrims, Hussein Hasdiamir Bey, Trans, Captain C. Channer.